Hello, everyone, and welcome to what will be in a few moments a conversation between myself and Sequoia Miller. Um, I wanted to start uh, the conversation today by presenting, um, uh, starting the presentation on my current body of work that I'm calling The Space Between, um, which is currently on view at Sculpture Space NYC in Long Island City, um, New York City. So my, the story of this body of work really begins in 2012 when I was diagnosed with an aggressive form of prostate cancer. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, my world was turned upside down. Um, many, you know, treatments and uh, sort of years went by with the idea that this cancer could be cured. And for a few years, it was undetectable. And so 2017, um, a blood test revealed that there were signs that, that the cancer was still you know, present in my body. So I was encouraged to think of it as no longer curable, but something that I must live with um, and um, as almost like a chronic illness for the rest of my life. So that was quite a milestone for me. And um, you know, uh, I began to think about instead of getting rid of something that I was afraid of, that was threatening, that I didn't like, I started to shift my mind toward wanting to getting really curious about it um, with the idea of finding a way to live with it and embrace it. So I'm sharing my screen and what you can see on the left are a series of 19th century Delftware pieces that we we think of as a garniture set and these kind of formal arrangements of ceramics were arranged um, for symmetry there was some idea that the symmetrical was very beautiful and they were presented usually in the more public part of um, a domestic interior like the living room on a mantelpiece for instance and i started thinking about these sets um, I was intrigued by the, I've always been intrigued by their symmetry and the negative spaces between the forms. Um, but I was also thinking about um, the idea of presenting something private through this kind of reference to ceramic history and making it more public. So one of my first things, narrative kinds of sets based on the garniture is shown on the right. And I call this insomnia set. And one of the things that happened with my ongoing health issues is that my sleep patterns changed. And I really no longer um, slept through the night, but I enjoyed <laughs> what I now call segmented sleeping, which is sleep a few hours, wake up, go back to sleep, wake up. So this piece is an attempt to, to capture some of the, the emotional um, and some of the spaces that are inherent in that kind of segmented sleeping. Um, this image is, you know, um, it's a depiction of cancer cells. And as I said, I started to get more curious and wanted to take a look, um, try to understand what was really going on. You know, I knew it conceptually, but um, this I find very beautiful and there's something kind of grotesque about looking inside the body, all those visceral squishy things, the bumpy textures of unhealthy cells and all of that. But somehow this rendering, um, I was able to see something quite beautiful, this idea of two things pulling apart. And I started to think about the, the possibility of a new space that's formed as things split. And then um, a piece like this, which I call tied tube garniture, um, is starting to use, think of those cell forms. Um, I'm making them, of course, building blocks for um, this centerpiece, which is a kind of hollow reference to pots, things that pour, or things that might have been functional, but also things inside the body. Um, and these harder, more architectural forms that have been cut almost as if there's a, there's a surgeon's knife on um, material that's extracting and like a surgery or to remove. And sort of this idea of removing through material to open it up to create space and also create something new. 
very much like man's intervention in the body um, with tech, sort of all the processes of trying to remove something through surgery and other types of treatment. This set I call Breathe, and I started to think of it as if um, it were some kind of representation of the lungs and perhaps a, a sort of the telescoping system of a spine in the center. Um, just the idea of these kind of referential vessels that are filled with these split cell type forms. It's a detailed shot. Which brings us to this piece, which are cause and effect bookends. And again, the fleshiness of this, um, almost like it refers to muscle tissue or something really squishy um, and just kind of uncomfortably about the body with these becoming kind of a bed for these split cell forms against this really hard architecture. Um, that's indicated, uh, you know, that sort of forms the structure of these um, sort of bookend shapes. And now we're going to join Sequoia Miller, and he's just asked me about the use of text in this particular work. I've always just, the, the text has been so fun for me to play with and to juxtapose imagery against and to be a part of this the aspect of my work. But the part of me that thought it actually added clarity for the audience of what I the, the story was, um, I realized it really was very, it's very confusing, actually. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and it's something in my attempt to connect I was creating a barrier, a kind of a barrier and a way that the audience would not have to overlay their own experiences and their own interpretations. It kind of set, shut certain things down that were connective tissue to the viewer. And, and that matters a lot to me. I, I make this work for myself, but I'm not, I, the fulfillment of making the work is that people can relate and connect to it. So yeah, sure. <laughs> the very important part. Um, so I, so as someone that's, a, you know, paying attention and cares about it, I just said, well, what would, what would be available if I started to minimize text or not use it at all and rely on other aspects of the form and surface for, to tell the story in a way that maybe is not, it's got more ambiguity and maybe in that ambiguity, there's more room for my audience to, to connect to it. Mm -hmm. So. Oh, can we go back for a second? I want to ask oh, you one other thing about, about this piece. So um, being an art historian now, of course, I'm thinking about other artworks that come to mind when, when I look at a piece like this and, and for this work, I'm, uh, I think of the, the piece by Joseph Boys called Fat Chair, which <laughs> looks like a you know like a wooden chair kind of with a kind of prison shape or like a triangle a wedge almost of of fat like of solidified fat in the chair and it's such an um, it's from the early seventies I think and it's such an effective piece and it's so like immediate and present and it present and it's kind of it's not gruesome exactly but it does it does have this component of the grotesque as you were saying and. You know, I've only seen this one in, in photos, but it, you know, that the fleshy part is so, looks really, really affecting in the, in the image. It's so kind of squishy and goopy looking. I'm, I'm wondering if you, maybe a broad question around this would be, how do you, or do you sort of think of, think of your work within this kind of broader context of sculpture outside of ceramic and what, and some of the kind of um, reactions that, that your work provokes that can call to mind some of these other um, kind of well-known well -known artworks? Um, I do think of my work in a bigger context of objects and traditions of making and sculpture and painting. And um, I think about that. Um, I, I don't, 
what is it? I'm someone that has to, um, it's all, it hasn't always been easy for me to be a good student of the world and to be someone looking at things and absorbing things and then to go deep within myself and find the authentic voice for a particular moment and bring that up to the surface through my hands into materials and, you know, to me, mediating those two things. So I don't really, um, what am I trying to say? I, I don't really spend a lot of time. When I'm in the studio, there's other things I'm looking at, but I'm not really looking a lot at what everybody else is doing. Not a lot. Um, and uh, I know that voice piece though, and I, this is the first I've even thought of that. It makes so much sense looking at this now. It just seems so obvious to me now, but um, I think um, how I, you know, and I mostly operate, you know, I, I live in New York City and I, many of the people in this meeting today are my colleagues and people that I consider to be really amazing artists. And um, it's just funny, I, I, um, I haven't really, contextualize my work out in the world to be seen um, a lot outside of, what am I trying, I, I don't, I don't know. I think the context in which the work is shown is very important somehow. And, uh, you know, I've had some really great opportunities to show it in some great places, but I, I, um, I don't show it a lot with other types of painting and other types of sculpt. You know, it's so not seen in those contexts mm -hmm. all the time. Right. right, some of which we have control over and some of which we don't. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. But I think also you're speaking to one of the, one of the, of course, challenges that so many artists in, in cities like New York will encounter, which is that sort of balance of filtration and sort of what you let through pass through your filters and what you don't and when you yeah. need to kind of shore them up a little bit so that you're not, you can kind of tune out some of the extraneous, but also feel connected in some ways. It, it, I mean, it's a, it's a complex question for sure for everyone. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> this one has such a cumbersome name, but I'm very, devoted to the name, which is apoptosis apernia. Do you know what an apernia is? Yeah, what, so tell us, what is, what is apoptosis apernia referred well, to? Apoptosis is, is, apoptosis is the natural kind of dying of cells that everybody, you know, has, goes through. But the apernia is a a form from the Victorian era is usually a silver and glass, but it's this very ornate centerpiece that has little glass dishes that hold fruit and flowers and right, oh right, 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 yeah, candles. And so the figure in the middle is inspired by that apernia, which is you know it has all the multiple compartments. In my case, they're not very functional, really. They're kind of folded in, and there's a sort of this mysterious closure to many of them. Um, and I like the idea of this occupying the centerpiece of the table, which of course is another place of celebration and nourishment, things where places that are more public, you know, when, within the home where um, rituals happen. So there's a few elements of the, you know, drawn from that decorative arts tradition that I used here for this one. Mm -hmm. You know, I think this might be a good one to ask you about color and how you think about color and usage uh, and its usage, because it, for me, this one has a great kind of balance between having that kind of very physical inside the body sort of organy and cells kind of feeling, but also being very like pretty and, and gracious in, in a way and thinking about how, how you were, I'm, I'm wondering how you were thinking about color and what, what affect you were trying to go for with the palette that you've used on this piece? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I, I'm a classicist by heart. I mean, I really do think of things very, like uh, I think of certain types of balancing and um, uh, symmetry and I tend toward those things. 
um, in this particular case, I was still in the world of skin, skin in terms of some of the coloration, some of the forms that relate maybe to those cell forms. And also I started to see as landscape related, um, hmm. almost like they become textures that have other associations and other scales and other sort of aspects of, of that. Um, but I, you know, I, I really, most of my time making ceramics, which is 36 years, I've really been involved with the surface as a, a really primary interest, like the, the building of color through in the chemistry of the materials changing and responding to that with more stuff and firing more stuff on and, <laughs> you know, more is more is more. So um, I, um, you know, the color is of, is really essential to, it's an essential concern when I'm making something. I really, I'm always thinking of it in color for the most part. I did make a piece not too long ago that was fairly colorless. And I, I felt like I had grown up in a new way. I don't know if it's gonna stick. It obviously hasn't, but I, um, I don't know. I think it's such an integral part of my love for ceramics is that those surfaces get fused to the form through the mm -hmm. fire. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'll always, you know, kind of have my hand in, a, in the color aspect. But yeah, I the, this one was just a little bit different. You're right. It has a slightly different field of color than some of the other pieces that we've seen here. So the back side. This I call Damoclesian Urn, and I was thinking of the famous story of Damocles and the sword that was suspended with the potential to fall at any time as a way of living with something chronic, like a mm -hmm. health condition. And so the, this urn became a stand-in for the body. Um, some of the references that we've talked about are there, and, um, and this kind of internal form that's on the wall that suspends this sword-like form of just a few inches above the lid of the urn. Could, could you speak to, um, to gender in this, in this work and sort of how you think about um, the gendering in your sculptures, particularly in this body of work where it's not, um, where you don't have sort of many representations of the surface of the body, so to speak, like a face or a head or something that would be very obviously a, a, a person. They tend to be more either symbolic as in this work or more like um, organ-like or internal elements. How, how are you, are you feeling like gender plays, is playing a role in this piece? These pieces less so, but I'm gonna, just a head or some gender considered pieces, I think that add, mm. that really address what you're saying. Okay. Um, maybe I can get get to those. I do, I do want to say about this work. I, oh, I'm glad you have a detail of the of the wall piece because I love how um, how like intestiny it, it looks and how kind of squishy <laughs> and there's this great tension between it kind of holding up this uh, you know this sword element versus feeling really squishy and soft and that's that kind of tension between being squishy and being strong. A sort of different types of ten, of strength tensile. Right. Yeah. I, like, um, I like that piece too. It was a very intuitive choice in a way, but it makes sense to me now. Okay, here we go. So this little series um, are the ones that take on gender a little bit more, I'd say, and they're slightly different. Um, they, I think I can just go kind of go through them. There's I think of them as figurines. There's certainly that scale of the ceramic figurine, and um, there's a whole history around figurines that, that I think about a little bit. But this one I called Masked Venus, and um, there's a split form that relates to the figure. Um, the masking or the wrapping of the top as kind of a I mean, masking is something we're all very familiar with right now. <laughs> right, yeah. We happen to be both very fluent in masking. We're all very fluent in masking, but this idea of, of the covering and then something 
and then the body being out for display as like an expression of fullness of maybe health, you know, like a Venus figure, you know, I think of the Venus of Willendorf, you know, a little bit that fertility figure. Um, you can see references to things that could be genitalia or male and female, mm -hmm. a little bit more. This piece is split Harlequin. It's sort of um, splitting that form open and using that split as a surface for a painted world that I think of as kind of a depicting an energy field of some kind. Hmm. And, and that's an interior, like a cell interior kind of, or more in One would, I mean, I don't know that cells look like that sequoia inside, but they, it felt to me like using that splitting, yes, in a way the impulse was just to open the form and then depict something relating to the internal life of that cell. Mm. This one I call preferred pronouns. And it is definitely using the hybridity of vessels as well as textures and things that are more female, you know, openings and things that are more male in terms of their, I mean, it's kind of got more overt gender. Um, but I'm just really, you know, intrigued with spaces, um, those spaces and the fluidity of gender and sort of thinking about, thinking about it spatially, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And sort of separation and distinction, yeah. like how much of gender is binary versus non-binary. Exactly. I think there's also this question with the, with this group around um, maybe this one in particular um, around scale in some way too. Like there's, I mean, it's really throughout the, throughout the whole body of work, but thinking about scale and gender and sort of the internal body. And in some ways I'm wondering to what extent cellular forms are gendered or like are organs gendered say like if you're like i'm thinking again of the garniture that had sort of a spine on the inside or or, or this one like sort of how gender expresses itself inside of our bodies basically <laughs> and kind of if it's not directly in the reproductive system like what is gendered about our internal selves i guess is one of the questions that comes up for me in this piece oh wow i'm gonna have to think about that one can I ask you one other question about that work? Sure. Um, I want to bring um, the uh, also a historical thing, the subject of George Orr into the conversation. So George Orr, of course, is an American potter from the turn of the 20th century who was, um, you know, very exper experimental and innovative in uh, making asymmetrical forms and kind of crumpled and rumpled wheel thrown forms, um, not widely celebrated during his lifetime and then rediscovered in the early 70s and has since become kind of central to particularly ceramic art history. And I'm curious if you think of, if you're interested in George Orr actually, and if you think of his kind of formal language as somehow um, informing, informing your say in this piece or in some other works. You know what I like, I do like George Orr and I feel like I've looked at George Orr for a long time, but what I'm really interested in with George Orr is this idea of the controlled collapse. Um, I, and when I refer to that for people that don't know, he, he threw many of his forms on the potter's wheel and he had all the skills to have them have that symmetry and fullness of form, but he chose to push them to the moment they were collapsing to create these folded um, kind of altered forms. And he had great skill in understanding the windows of time, you know, the windows of materiality to be able to control how they failed. And failure is such an enormous part of what I'm exploring in my work right now is this idea of things that, you know, of course the body failing, but also things that um, are scraps that I pick up and make a new form from. You know, there's many ways that I'm kind of thinking about the regeneration of things failing and then re being reborn as the same time I'm pursuing some of these other ideas. So, George Orr is really important 
in that way to me. And I, I do love his work and maybe there are some, I do see what you mean about, it. I can see some tie-ins to visually um, from this piece to George Orr per se, but. I think failure, totally. I can see that sort of that, that moment of kind of, of collapse or of letting go in a way of where the where the kind of tension or, or the rigidity leaves the leaves the work and then you're left with this sometimes you know beautiful complex other sort of visual system in a way. Absolutely. So I'm showing all this because the second theme of the show has been my born of my time in Israel in 2019. I was invited to be a, get, a visiting artist at the Betz LL Art Academy in Jerusalem. Um, and I was there and I was staying in Jerusalem near the old city, just outside the walls of the old city, um, right on what they know as the scene between a more traditionally Israeli neighborhood and a Palestinian or, uh, you know, neighborhood. And, um, near the Damascus gate. And I started to really, from my daily observations, see the porosity of what used to be a real strong border um, between these two very famously disparate groups and how they there's much more flow back and forth and there's much more connection points um, that are happening. It's very, of course, complicated. And um, I was really fascinated by that. So, in my residency, I started to think about, um, you know, kind of that idea of a seam or a, a border. And that led me to, um, for some reason, I'm having trouble finding my cursor. Oh, here we go. It led me to this little series, which is based on the ink blot. Um, where I just, you know, I started in the studio there with these drawings where I was just folding paper like you would make, you know, an ink blot and then making these- You know, like you, like you do, right? <laughs> like <laughs> everyone does. <laughs> so I got really excited about the drawings. And then while I was there, I was able to make my first study for sculpture, which is shown in the middle here. Um, to think of the language of these hollow ceramic forms and how that would translate into these, um, these kinds of works. Um, cool. Come on. <laughs> Sorry. There it is. Uh, this piece, which is in the show, is I call Tanuki um, garniture, actually. But it, you, this is a very bad drawing that I that I displayed in the gallery because it's just a working drawing from the studio that I actually laid that used to lay down on sheets of clay that be, that became these three dimensional objects below. But um, I do love almost like a work in progress. I love the relationship of the two D and the three D together. So I'm showing it not because it's showable, but I'm showing it because I'm interested in looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good reason to show it. <laughs> I do think the ceramic works are finished for, you know, but the, I don't think that the drawing is being particularly a finished work, but again, you know, the space in between starts to look like a body and there's more really overt choices that I've made in the treating of the surface and the forms themselves that are more referential to actual bodies than maybe some of the other pieces. Can I ask you to describe that a little bit? Like, what do, what do you see as the as the indicators or the choices that have, that make this more body like? Well, I mean, I there's just things that look like breasts or balls or, you know. To me, it starts to take on a bit more of a figurative. Like uh, the kind of pink blushing at the end of these. Kind of pink blushing. Areas. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I was definitely thinking more literally about that kind of way to depict the body than I, I was in some other pieces that we've mm. seen, for sure. This one also was born of a, that ink blot. Um, it's, I call it spawn, S-P-A-W-N, garniture. And uh, 
you know, um, it starts to, those black forms start to operate in some interesting ways to me, you know, like different references to ceramic histories and skin color. And, you know, there's a whole, there's just a whole lot of different things that could be referenced in the language of this. Um, I guess for me, one thing I like about this work is that, it, or find compelling about it, is that it feels like it's both depicting the body from the outside and from the inside at the same time. Wow. So it's it's not like clear whether you're inside the body, whether as the viewer you're inside the body or not in this kind of way. And and I feel also like the black um, components are they're almost like negative spaces or almost like not there spaces. Or and I think of like you know, these things that you have to drink when you get some kind of test so that your blood or whatever system like shows up or irradiates that the question of sort of what is visible under what conditions, right? What systems or what um, what uh, sort of pathways maybe through our bodies are visible under, under what conditions is part of what this makes me think about. I think there's also, I'd love to bring into the conversation the idea of the abject and the notion of there, there being a um, sort of a visual language that is, I guess it gets to this idea of, of grotesquery that you spoke to earlier, like making the grotesque beautiful. And there's, some, I think the component of this piece that feels like you're inside the body that feels very organy and very like squishy and icky kind of, and it has this real tension for me between being beautiful and being icky a little bit. I hope you understand. And I'm thinking about, so bear with me for a second because it's gonna get a little bit um, a little bit further away from your work, but I'm thinking about this idea of the abject and, and um, the writer Julia Kristeva proposes the abject as a kind of dissolution of the distinction between the subject and the object. So where a, where a physical form or an, a kind of bodily experience goes from being like a, a person to a thing in a way. So in a sense, the classic example is like a corpse, right? Which is disorienting or disturbing to us, or we, we put into the, we tend to put into the category of abject, the sort of otherness of, of the abject because a corpse is both, you know, it resonates both on the level of being a person and, and of being this like squishy, icky, mucky thing. And um, and I guess I'm, I've been thinking about this question of abjection and otherness and the dissolution of subject and object as, as being an in-between state, right? As, which it seems like is so central to this body of work that, that in-betweenness and the liminality and how these are in fact through their kind of visible um, representation as bodies and not bodies and as things and as not people exactly, but as subjects as well as objects, that it, it very much holds that in between, in between state for me. Oh, I'm so glad. Because that that's my interest is that state, that kind of the that those really truly gray areas between those things. Yeah. I do, yeah, I love I love the idea of this being not clear if you're inside or on the outside looking at it as one of those in between areas that really makes me happy. Now this one I'm going to play. This is a video. It's just short, but I wanted to. I'm Linda Sorman. I think is here, but she came to the gallery and very generously. Um, you know, we talked about the work, but this was just um, a moment of us talking about this piece. And I'm just going to play it. I see if it. Yeah, I think just being able to move. Yeah, to be able to move around this piece, we've just been recording the voices, but I think that what this, you know, really demands that kind of experience through like seeing and experiencing how this volume just lays itself down on the pedestal and it has this soft mass of living tissue, you know, that blush is alive, that glaze, the way you're able to play with color too. Now, I think that that here so, really makes a, it live. I also love it when a piece is cast their own shadows like that. They cast shadows on themselves. I, kind of a I feel shadow. like I have so much more to do to utilize the shadows of objects as creating, you know, real, uh, there's a different sense of um, 
engagement with the sight that comes from the way the light can extend the shape through its shadow. And I've always been interested when I see other artists working that way. And you know, it's just on the list of I'll get to it. You know, somehow. Well, here it is. You know? like, yeah. And just the idea of like knowing that a form like this or forms like this exist in our bodies, we understand that, but we don't really feel it until we are in presence of um, these soft volumes that right. convey it. Through. There's nothing in our experience that would make that stand out. Right. In our awareness of our right this reminds us of the fold and the complexity and the mass of what things are contained and then you contain the text in there the yes and the no and the title by heart is it by heart is it yes i love how you describe that as being the poles that we hold inside ourselves yeah for sure you see i think the work the work really is about this really personal you know, examination of the inside and the way the really interesting thing is the connective tissue to the macro and to you know the the splits, the poles, and then Palestinians and Israelis. You know, they live in here and then they live out here in these kind of macro ways. And you know, it's easy to be an individual and not connect to that, not see that. The, the thing that we're responding to out there is something that is within each of us, usually, at the core. Um, yeah, I think just to be able to. So thank you, Linda, for that moment. It was so nice to be with you in this gallery. Matt, I want to flag that we're a bit over 45 minutes here, so we can, we. Could think about opening it up to some questions in a little bit, or maybe speak to a few more pieces. Sure. This is such a oh. good one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to quickly go to the end. This is um, a piece that I was thinking about conjoinment as a way to think of the space or the disappearing space between two forms. Um, this little guy is. I call lumpy Limoges set, but it's it's really about a claustrophobic collection that's held in this little tray of almost no space between the objects. And then this is a view of the installation. Great. So should I just open up the chat and see if there's any questions before we go? I think so. I think that would be great. Okay, let me see if I can do that. Um, Maybe while you do that, I'll say that in the image that we're looking at now, we can see the conjoined piece in the middle of the gallery. And I feel like now that I'm thinking of it in this way, that's actually for me, like a real um, kind of not an illustration exactly, but a real physical representation of that idea of the melding of subject and object, right? Of those two kind of poles sort of coming together and being conjoined. Absolutely. So let's see if there's anything. I think the chat is open. Not with... Let me try. Yep. Anybody have any comments? Oh, you want something. <laughs> <Yeah>. That's me. <laughs> Thanks, Donna. The conjoined one also feels a little gendered to me too, in that it's sort of like it has a kind of frilly pinky part of it and it sort of gets to this. And then maybe the Limoges pieces too and the kind of claustrophobia sense of like there's there's something, um, I don't, I don't wanna say dainty exactly, but there's something about thinking of it as like a Limoges set that sort of puts it into this kind of world of propriety in a way that you like then take it out of so so profoundly but it's so funny it's so great that like that's your starting point for thinking about like how to have a tray of organs i know it'll be like a limoge set there's something very queer about that that i love yeah. i know totally <laughs> totally 
So maybe I'll read the I'll read the chat questions to you since they're mostly I think going to be addressed to you. So um, this person is asking you to speak about the lattice forms on the earlier pieces. It seems new and structural in a way that's different. Yeah, I you know that lattice again. I I um, it's a, it it allows me to think of other traditions um, of that type of. Skin, which is you know attached to decorative arts and pat pattern and decoration and all kinds. Of, there's a language that I've always been interested in there that I can bring back in. But I was mostly involved with the the, the idea of cutting through this skin-like material with a very sharp knife and extracting something like a mechanical moving toward a hardness, and, but through removals. It's like a series of small removals. Um, so um, again, I, you know, it's I guess as a symbol to the uh, in the language of this series of work, it really represents man's intervention or some kind of system of surgery or hard these hard mechanical forms that are built or rational systems based on a grid, uh, you know, to superimpose against these soft kind of moving, collapsing sometimes organic forms. So to me, there's a story in the, to be told in the juxtaposition of the two together. It feels like that's also very much a ceramic story in some way or, a, or a, a way that the medium can um, sort of speak to those two states of mind or ways of thinking or being in the world, the, the organic or, or the bodily and then versus or maybe in conjunction with the with the geometric or the rational or the structural mm -hmm. or something ceramic and I think in a way that's distinct kind of implies both of those and a, and a question in the chat around this this idea of of structure through removal is being connected to architecture or sort of the built um, the built environment they do look like bridges a little bit like the the uh, the bookends piece kind of evokes yeah. like the Williamsburg, not the Williamsburg, the um, the George Washington Bridge a bit. Yeah, well, architecture was, you know, a, my course of study in college. So, it you know, there are definitely those aspects to those forms for me, you know, as maybe not the primary focus, but it's definitely some something that's there. And I think maybe you know, it's also the analytical and the intuitive, right? It's the balance between mm -hmm. analytical and intuitive is another kind of layer, a metaphorical layer we can add on there. Yeah. I see a question here about my technique. What drives me to use so many different techniques in one piece? Oh boy. <laughs> um, I, uh, I'm just a maximalist. I don't know what to say. I mean, there's, I've definitely made some ground um, over the years in terms of how, um, you know, moments where there's some breathing room in a particular work. In my mind, there are more moments now than there used to be. But, you know, um, letting something live with, in a different space to communicate more of the story, more like a reduction is something I I actively think about, but I I'm just I'm just a maximalist. I just more I just have so much that wants to be there, and I, I don't know. So I don't know how to I don't know. <laughs> it's a pathology, is what it is. <laughs> I think you're making pretty good use of your pathology if it is one. <laughs> um, maybe I'll highlight this last comment that, that came in for the for the full chat. So um, commenting on how amazingly honest. Um, uh, with your your work ethic, that's always been a point of respect. You've always been willing to show what so much about what you're feeling on uh, social or political situations, and of course, you're uh, with cancer um, being so private. And now, um, true to form, you're being honest, and the work continues with this honesty. So, it's a it's a wonderful comment, and I think really um, sort of respectful of your vulnerability, of the position of vulnerability that you're put yourself into, and. I think you spoke earlier about this um, the sort of public private and the shift in, in narrative in a way. And I wonder if it feels uncomfortable in some way to be, um, 
to be open about all of these questions? Yes, it's 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 somewhat excruciating. <laughs> It might even be a pathology, right? <laughs> uh, I think what I've learned, um, really what, one of the, the beauties of a life like this and a life as a maker and making things, what I learned very early on is if I had the boldness, well, first of all, my studio work has always called me to be honest in a way that I haven't always been able to rise up and be in other aspects of my life. Um, so that's good, um, but that boldness to have the vulnerability come through in that more honest, direct way, I've really seen, um, you know, I guess the fear is abandonment if they only see how, you know, uh, uncool I am or how, you know, damaged I am, somehow they'll all leave me. You know, I think that's the kind of childhood fear, but but the, the opposite is true, is mm. it's never failed me to be a connective tissue to others and to um, have depths of conversations and connections that me beginning by setting the stage with the vulnerability gives me somebody being vulnerable with me. And there's a true space for us to really go deep and connect. So it's, it's, it still doesn't make it easier each time I have to kind of work into it, you know, cause I just, I'm, I, um, I'm really not very public as a person. I'm not really, but you know, the work, I mean, I guess sometimes if it's just left up to you as the personality, things would remain very safe and small. But if you can find things that you believe in that have a, that you can, it allows you to step beyond your own limitations as a person and sort of like take that bold risk. And, and making work has really given me that opportunity to practice that. So I'm really mm -hmm. grateful for it. I feel like you're really speaking to the power of kind of confronting yourself, oneself in the in the space of making, whether it's in a studio or outside of a studio, like in a way it sort of fo forces that relationship, I think, in the best of circumstances that you're like you're making something and you're like alone with it. And if it doesn't in if it doesn't interest you, it's not going to interest anybody, right? If it doesn't like provoke some set of like um, some kind of critical confrontation or something like that if it doesn't open something up then then it's not gonna it's not gonna happen and and i feel like that's so much the power of of being an artist is finding yourself in that in that space and finding as you said like sort of going past your limitations it's kind of like identifying what they are what you think they are what you thought they were or something and then just moving into somewhere else it's like that discovering of that space in between the the garniture elements or something you like find some other way of understanding that yeah a thousand percent beautifully said yeah okay Anything well mr else? matt is that our conversation <laughs> is that what our conversation looks like i guess <laughs> I'm so happy to finally see it. <laughs> um, well, I want to thank everybody for coming and um, what a privilege. Oh, Linda Sorman. I'm do you just... want to read this one? Yeah, do you want to? Yeah, I'll read it out loud. So um, I guess Linda writes, I feel this amazing tension in your garnitures between a formal elegance, a language that usually pulls towards some kind of resolution and exquisite uncertainty. How do you work toward resolving forms if you do? Oh boy, how do I work toward resolving them? Um, well, the first way I work toward resolving them is, is I remove, I put obstacles in the way of my, um, Oh, what is it? I, I try to encourage a dance with, as I said before, with my intuitive mind. 
I really want the work to lead me somewhere unexpected. I want where I start or how I conceive of it when I start to not be where I end. I don't really want to make a drawing and then make an object based on my drawing sort of thing. So the resolution is so it's ever changing. You know, I um, um, I like I know I guess I know when something feels I know it's like an intuitive response, but I kind of feel I know when it's presenting a place to stop, and then I I hope to listen to that and stop. Um, but um, it's always changing. Each project is because of the way I'm working now. It's sort of hard to say um, how I think of resolution. It it sort of like surprises me. Mostly, I tend toward overtouching and over, like maybe too many techniques in one piece. So, um, but. But I do have an inherent sense of when, when it's when I've arrived for now. So um, I don't think that addressed the question, Linda. That was such a good question. It's one I'll be thinking about more. <laughs> I would call it trust too. I would just bring trust into that conversation around um, under knowing yourself as an artist and, and trusting yourself. Yeah, that's a huge thing. You know, I. Um, I haven't always been driven by trusting myself. I've, I've you know, some of the, so honestly, some of the, the ways of working or, you know, ambition by trying to prove my worth, you know, through the work, maybe a little more. And I must say is where I'm sitting now, I, I have much more, um, I really do trust myself more. I mean, my impulses aren't really driven by your responses out there, but by my own um, sense of what's important and how it's going. And, you know, I don't really look to the outside quite as much as I used to. And I think, I hope it shows in, in what I'm doing and my ability to keep transforming the work and growing the work, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, Matt, thank you so much for inviting me to join you for this conversation. It's been such a treat to speak with you about your work. Oh, thank you so much, Sequoia. It's a treat to see you as always. And thanks everybody for coming and happy holiday.